Good evening, this is Eric Conti, Superintendent of Schools. We're here for our fourth installment of Thursday Night Must See COVID TV. Um, we're joined this evening by Barbara Conley, our nurse leader in the district. And Barbara's gonna go over some really important information for uh, families and some of the other protocols that are happening in the district regarding COVID. If you don't get this information the first time, BCAT will be replaying this. And uh, if you want to make sure that you get all the right information, before we start, I'd like to extend some gratitude to BCAT itself, to Jen Dodge, Robert Paris, who is uh, producing tonight's show and has produced the prior Thursday shows. I also wanna make sure that I'll, I thank um, Susan Luminello from the Board of Health and Christine Pollack, because they have been partners in developing a lot of this information uh, with the district and they put in a lot of time. So with that, I'm gonna turn over tonight's show to uh, our wonderful nurse leader, Barbara Conley, and, um, and this is a pre-taped show because of some scheduling issues, so we're not taking questions, but we'll make an opportunity for uh, parents to ask questions or to email questions in, and we'll make sure we get them answered. So thank you very much. With that, Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Conti, and welcome, parents. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Conti for um, letting me present this evening. Um, I think it's critical that we explain to the parents what's going on and what role they can take to help create a safe environment with the schools as a partnership for Burlington Public Schools. So we can put up slide one. Okay, before I get started, I'd like to make the disclaimer that these protocols and scenarios were designed and based on the present information that we have in COVID-19 as of yesterday, 8-19-20. COVID-19 is such a fluid situation that situations are, are changing very quickly. So I just wanna make sure that parents are aware of that and our protocols and scenarios will change according to the DPH regulations. Next slide, please. So here's my table of content. Oh, and I also wanted to let you know that this PowerPoint is intended to be posted on the website under the health services tab, so you can uh, review it at any of your time, any time that's convenient for you, and the links are attached to it. So table of contents, I'm gonna be talking about COVID-19, what it is, how it's spread, what is a close contact quarantine and isolation, contact tracing and testing, what parent supports and expectations we have, scenarios of uh, how we're gonna handle things, immunization requirements, closure decisions by the Burlington Board of Health, and then the last slide will have the nurse leader, myself's contact information if you have any uh, particular questions. Next slide, please. So first I wanted to let you know what COVID-19 is. I'm sure most of you know it's a virus. Uh, essentially came out in the, in the United States in December of 2019. It's spread throughout the world, so it is a pandemic. The illness can range from mild to severe illness, um, and it varies in each individual. It's spread predominantly with respiratory droplets. Individuals can spread the virus up to two days before the onset of symptoms. Most people infected with COVID-19 uh, virus recover without requiring special treatment or being hospitalized. Next slide, please. What is a close contact? You are a close contact if any of the following situations happen. Well, you, are, well, you spent time with a person that is a probable or confirmed case of COVID-19, even if they don't have symptoms. So, that's you've had physical contact with the person, typically 48 hours before they're confirmed to have COVID-19 or became symptomatic. We're within six feet of that person for about 10 to 15 minutes, had contact with the person's respiratory secretions, for example, getting a cough or sneeze directly into the face, or you stayed overnight for at least one night in a household with a person that is diagnosed with COVID-19. So if a person had symptoms and your child fits the criteria for the two days before the symptoms started, they would be considered a close contact. If a person has no symptoms and your child fits the criteria of the two days before the positive specimen was obtained, they are considered a close contact. The Board of Health takes the lead on this and will determine who is considered a close contact. Next slide, please. What does it mean to be under quarantine? A quarantine is used to keep someone who may have been exposed to COVID-19 away from others. 
People in quarantine should stay at home for 14 days after exposed to COVID-19, separate from others, monitor their symptoms, stay in a separate room from other household members if possible, use a separate bathroom as po if possible, avoid contact with other members of the household and pets, don't share personal household items like cups, towels, and utensils, and wear a mask when you're around your family members if you're able to. Monitor your health and see um, your doctor if needed and follow directions from the state and local health department. Next slide, please. So what's isolation mean? Isolation is used to separate people who are infected with COVID-19 from people who are not. So steps that this should, should be taken in isolation are to monitor your symptoms, stay in a separate room from other household members if possible, use a separate bathroom if possible, avoid contact with other members of the household and pets, don't share personal household items like cups, towels, and utensils, and wear a mask when around other people if you're able to. Next slide, please. So for example, if your child is declared to be on quarantine because they are defined and found to be a close contact per the Board of Health, and we find out on, say, the first of the month, then your child will be on quarantine till the 15th of the month. So you may not find out till the second of the third day, but it is based on the last day that they had contact with the positive or presumed case. So I just wanna make sure that's clear. The last day of exposure is considered day zero. Next slide, please. So this case scenario is if you have a sick child at home and you're a parent and you must ch provide child care or care, medical care or sick care to your child. So your child is on a 10 day isolation period, but because you are a close contact to your ill child, the parent will now have to be on a 14 day quarantine at the end of their illness. So it is behooves parents if they have an older child who is independent in their, self, uh, in their, their care while they're ill to become quarantined from their child. Some situations you can't do that, other situations you can. But tons of scenarios are posted on the CDC website if you need to refer to them and the link is on the bottom of this slide. Next slide, please. So what is contact tracing? Contact tracing is used by the state and local um, health department to stop the spread of an infectious disease. Contact tracing slows the spread of COVID-19 by Health department letting people know that they've been exposed to COVID-19 and should monitor their health signs and symptoms. Helping people who may have been exposed to COVID-19 get tested and asking people to isolate if they have COVID-19 or quarantine, or quarantine if they are declared a close contact to someone with COVID-19. Let me reassure you, discussions with the health department are extremely confidential. Your name will not be shared and neither will the school department share your name. Next slide, please. So it is imperative on this slide, you can see that answering your call from the Board of Health or a contact tracer from the state is absolutely critical because if you become a confirmed positive case, they will call you, they will have a discussion with you about who have you been with the two days before you became symptomatic. That is your shedding period. At that time, they would declare everyone that you were under a close defined close contact definition. They would then call all those people and notify them that they are a close contact to the positive case. And then they would be quarantined. So it's imperative that if you get a phone call on your phone and you're not aware of the number to please still answer. It could be the Board of Health or it could be a state contact tracer trying to notify you. Next slide. So types of COVID-19 testing. There's two types. One is a viral swab and the other one is an antibody. The viral swab tests you for your current diagnosis of COVID-19. They wanna know if you are presently ill with the virus. The best test is the PCR testing. The second test is an antibody testing. 
That's a test, and it's not currently recommended at the time. It's, to, it's a test to find out if you've had it in the past. Um, that's not going to benefit you, benefit you at the present time um, because it's been known that you can get reinfected. But so at this time, viral testing is the, the testing choice. Next slide. So let's talk about the different uh, swabs. There are molecular tests and antigen tests. The antigen test has been found to be not accurate, so it's not recommended. Typically, those are the ones that you get back your results very quickly. You're talking an hour, maybe one or two hours. You want a molecular test. Those are extremely accurate. They can take two to seven days to come back. And um, if you do have an antigen test and you are positive, you are what they call presumed positive. So you become a probable case and they will make you go get a molecular test. So you should just go right to the correct test in the first place and have that done. Next slide, please. So is testing covered by insurance? Yes, it is most of the time. COVID testing for symptomatic individuals is usually covered by insurance and available at no cost. But please verify that with the testing site. Many testing sites in Massachusetts also test uninsured individuals for free. Next slide, please. So local testing sites in Burlington. I put this graph together for you so that if you do need to go get some testing, these testing sites do test children. They are drive-through sites, um, and you just want to call them and make an appointment ahead of time. Usually, um, if you have an urgent care appointment, most of them are urgent cares. If you walk in, they typically will see you and do the testing there, but every place is different, so I would definitely call and book an appointment if that is needed. Next slide, please. This is an interactive testing map. This will tell you all the testing sites in the Massachusetts. It is updated weekly, I believe on Wednesdays. And um, this is clickable, so you can open that from the PowerPoint and look at the active testing sites available. Next slide. Parent supports and expectations. I know this slide looks very long. There's a lot of material on it. We're gonna go step by step with it. But every component here is very important to help us create a safe environment for our school. It is required to have a daily morning screening of every child coming to school. We must practice mask wearing and masks are required to be worn in all schools at all ages. Practice social distance, distancing, practice hand washing, practice respiratory etiquette. We need to practice avoid touching the face. Call your child out of school when they're ill or symptomatic and indicate the reason for the absence. Respond to medical and board of health calls. Follow required illness guidelines and quarantine and isolation protocols. And mandated mass department health um, immunization requirements have been updated, and I will explain those later in the presentation. And testing requirements if your child has traveled in the last 14 days. Next slide, please. So home screenings of students are required of all parents of all children attending um, Burlington Public Schools in any school in the state of Massachusetts. This is a home screening. Next slide. So these are the details of the screening that must be done at home in the morning prior to sending your child to school or taking the bus. So today, or in the past 72 hours, has your child had any of the following symptoms? So we're looking for a fever, specifically 100 or higher, chills or shaking, chills, a cough, but not due to a known medical condition. Some people do have a persistent cough, so this is a very specific type of cough. Difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, a new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, headache, but when combined with other symptoms. So just with a student having a headache, that's fine, they can come to school. Muscle aches or body aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, when in combination with other symptoms, a new rash, especially on the toes and fingers, and nasal, nasal congestion or runny nose. The additional questions are, in the past 14 days, my child has had close contact with a person known or identified to have COVID-19. Within the last 14 days, have you been diagnosed with COVID-19 or had a test confirming that you have the virus? 
And additionally, we want to know and make sure that you do not send your children to school with fever-reducing medication without consulting with your school nurse. This imperative, these medications do um, mask symptoms, and we want to know if your child in school does have symptoms. Next slide, please. So proper mask requirements for all students. So we require them to fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face. Cover your mouth and your nose. Be secured with ties or ear loops. Include multiple layers of fabric. Allow for breathing without restriction and be able to be laundered and machine dried without damage or change in shape if it's a cloth mask. If it's a disposable mask, those are permitted, but you must have a new one on every day. They're not reusable. Face coverings that we will not be allowing in Burlington Public Schools are bandanas, gator face coverings, or fat face masks with an exhalation valve, only because their air and their secretions do come through that valve, and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of wearing a face mask. Burlington schools will have emergency backup disposable masks for students if needed, and they will be stored in the nurse's office. Next slide. Students that need mask exemption or accommodations. Essentially, these are gonna be students that have medical conditions, a disability, or a health or safety factor that needs to be considered. Additionally, any child under the age that attends Sprouts, anyone with a known respiratory difficulty that uses oxygen supplementation, or anyone that is incapacitated or un unable to remove the face covering. Please note, if your child cannot wear a mask, we must have the medical conditions on file in the nurse's office, and we must have a note from your healthcare provider indicating that no mask is necessary. The teachers and support staff that service all students with hearing impairment must wear a transparent mask. We call them smile masks. And I'm sure you've seen Patrick Larkin around town or even on BCAT sessions wearing one. Uh, this enables these students to lip read. Next slide, please. Proper way to put on a mask. So please ensure your mask must is clean, dry, and not damaged. Wash and dry your hands before putting on your face covering. When putting on the mask, do not touch the front of it. You should only handle the ties and the air straps. Put it over your nose and mouth and secure it under your chin. Try to fit it snugly against the skin of the face with no gaps. Make sure you can breathe easily and wash your hands. Next slide, please. So proper way to take off your mask. You're gonna wash your hands. Do not touch the front of the mask or the inside of the mask. Remove the mask by the straps and ties. If it is disposable mask, toss it out. In school, the soiled side of the mask will be placed on a paper towel during mask breaks, snack time, or lunch time. If it is a washable mask, put it in the laundry. But in school, again, the soil side of the mask will be placed on a paper towel during a mask break, a snack time, or lunch time. And then again, wash your hands. Next slide, please. While wearing a mask, do not touch the front of the mask. If you do, clean your hands and dry them thoroughly. Avoid touching your face, as infection can still be introduced by touching your eyes, and if you're not wearing your mask right correctly. Face mask should not be moved during use. This includes being pulled up or pulled down below the chin. If you need to remove your mask, for example, to eat, remove it safely, dispose of it appropriately, and clean your hands. Replace the face mask if it becomes damp, damaged, or soiled. Next slide, please. So as you can see, a lot of people are very visual, so that's why I put this in here. This is how to properly wear and use a mask. So you have your do's and your don'ts. So as you can see, it's showing on the right the don'ts, do not touch the front of the mask, don't pull it below your nose. Um, and then the do's, are, you wanna wash your, your hands before and after putting on or removing your mask. Use the ties and the loops to put your mask on and take it off. Cover your mouth and nose, bridge and chin. Very important. Next slide. Cleaning the cloth mask. Cloth mask should be washed after use. In a washing machine, you can lose, use a lingerie bag or a pillowcase to put them in. 
you could either wash them by hand with a, ble a bleach solution. It's suggested two, uh, four tablespoons of household bleach with a quart of water. Soak the face covering in bleach solution for five minutes and then rinse it thoroughly. But one of the most important parts is drying it. You can either dry it in a dryer or air dry, but the mask needs to be completely dry before wearing it again. And then of course, disposable masks should be discarded after each use and not washable. Next slide, please. Social distancing. Practice of uh, purposeful re reducing close contact with people. Stay away from crowds and mass gatherings. Maintain this distance. The closer you are, the better chance of COVID. So you want to maintain that social distancing. Decrease exposure for yourself and others in preventing the spread of the virus. Next slide. Hand hygiene. Cleaning your hands by either hand washing or hand sanitizer. Purpose, to clean your hands and reduce the spread of infections. Hand hygiene is probably one of the most preventable ways to spread an infection. Next slide, please. How to wash your hands with soap and water. Follow the five steps every single time. You wanna wet your hands with water, running water. It doesn't matter if it's warm or cold. Apply the soap. But the most important part is to really lather your hands, cover all your surfaces, scrubbing, scrubbing between your fingers, under your nails, um, between your fingers again, under those nails, and back and forth on your hands. Scrub, scrub, scrub for 20 seconds. And it's best to teach your child hum the happy birthday song at the, at the beginning to the end and have them do it twice. Practice makes perfect. perfect. Uh, rinse your hands. Uh, well under, um, very well under clean water, running water. Turn off the faucet with a paper towel and then dry your hands using a clean paper towel. Next slide. So here's a visual on how to wash your hands. I know children are visual, so that's why I put this in. Please review this with your children. It's imperative that they understand what they need to do, how to do it, and for how long. So again, wet the hands, apply the soap, Lather and scrub for 20 seconds, humming happy birthday twice. Rinse the hands, turn off the tap, and then dry their hands with a paper towel. Next slide. How to wash your hands with hand sanitizer. So first you wanna apply it to the palm, rub your palms together, rub your hands together, wait until the hands feel dry. Highly recommend that you do this for 20 seconds, just like you do when you wash your hands with soap and water. Next slide. When to perform hand hygiene. Washing your hands with soap and water or with a hand sanitizer frequently. Hand hygiene should be done often, but always after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing, after being in a public place, after eating or preparing food, after using the toilet, after changing a diaper, before and after uh, treating a cut or wound, after touching an animal, animal feed or animal waste, after touching garbage, before putting your mask on or, or after you touch the contaminated side of, of the mask, and before and after touching your face. Next slide, please. So respiratory hygiene is critical. So you wanna teach your children to cover their mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing. Use a tissue once and throw the tissue away immediately in a trash receptacle. Wash your hands or use a hand sanitizer every time you touch your mouth or nose. The big factor I wanna implement here or stress here, and I should have added this to the slide, this needs to be done with the mask on. The mask should not be removed. We wanna keep the respiratory secretions inside the mask. If their child's mask does get soiled from sneezing, they will be sent to the nurse's office for a brand new mask. Next slide, please. So when you cough or sneeze, cover your nose and mouth with a tissue or cough or sneeze into your elbow, not your hand. Again, with the mask on. Please share this with your children. They're very visual and they're better understandings when they see the cartoons. Next slide, please. Avoid touching the face. So science has shown if you watch someone for a, a, a period of time, in one hour, they will touch their face about 23 times. And this demonstrates about how many times they touched their, their face. Next slide, please. 
So I came up with ways to decrease the touching of the face. These are just ideas, but be, be mindful of not touching your face. So things you can do is limit bringing your cell phone to your face and use the speaker feature. Use post-it notes to remind yourself not to touch your face. Interlock your fingers or fold your fingers at, or your hands and place them in your lap. You can even have your child sit on their hands. Ask people to remind you if they notice you are touching your face. Use an elastic to snap, up, um, snap on your wrist to keep your hands occupied. Use a manipulative to keep your hands busy. Keep your hair tied back so that you're not putting your hands up and moving your hair off your face. Make sure your eyeglasses fit you well. And you, if you must touch your face, use a tissue and sanitize your hands pre and post. Next slide. If you call your child out sick, it's really imperative for us to know the reason. So we are requesting that when you call your child out on the absent line of your school, please include the reason for their absence if they are ill. If it's an appointment, that's fine. Whatever the other cases are fine. But if they are out for illness, please let us know why. So additionally, if you're absent, if your child is going to be absent for testing pot because they tested positive for COVID-19, has been declared a close contact by the Board of Health, is symptomatic and you or and or you need assistance or direction on how to proceed, please call your nurse's office. Next slide. Review when to keep your child home. Again, this is part of your screening process. If your child's not feeling well, it is absolutely imperative to keep them home. These again are all the symptoms that are listed on the COVID website or the CDC website for COVID and that we're asking you to screen your child um, before sending them to school or on the bus. Next slide. Additional criteria again. In the past 14 days, have they had close contact with a person infected? In the last 14 days, have been they, they've been diagnosed? And has your child had fever-reduced medication, fever reducing medication in the last 12 hours? Please consult with your school nurse. Next slide. Respond to medical calls. Please answer your phone if the school is calling. Child, your child could be ill. Child could be identified as a close contact of someone in the classroom. The school nurse should be um, is trying to contact you about a medical situation or question. So please, if you see the Burlington Public Schools number up here on your phone, please answer. Um, if you do not, if you have a phone number coming up that's very unfamiliar um, and you're not sure who it is, it could be the Board of Health or State contact or um, tracing um, person in the contact um, tracing team for the state trying to reach you. So we respectfully ask that if you have an unfamiliar number appear on your phone that you still answer. Next slide, please. Adhere to the illness guidelines and quarantine isolation protocols. This is a protocol that's gonna be sent to you at home and it's going to give you very clear direction on screening and when to, tell, uh, when to keep your children home. I have this link to this slide because this uh, PowerPoint is going to be on the health services website and you can refer to that document at your leisure. Next slide. Students, a student has symptoms at home and what should you do? Next slide, please. So if your child, um, so first thing, if your child has symptoms at home, do not send them to school. Call the, the school sick line and inform that your student is staying home due to symptoms. The student should be tested. Isolate them at home until test results are returned. So once you have those results back, this is what needs to be done. If they're negative, they must stay home until symptom-free for 24 hours without fever-reducing medication. If they're not tested, they unfortunately have to stay home for 10 days from the start of the symptom as long as their symptoms have improved and they have been without fever-reducing medication for 24 hours. That's when they can return to school. If your child is tested and they become positive, they are now considered to be on isolation protocol and they must be out for the full 10 days plus three days have passed with no fever and improved symptoms without fever reducing medication. Next slide. So here's your next case scenario. Student tests positive for COVID-19. Next slide. COVID-19, 
student is to remain home, except for, of course, if they need medical care. Stay home for at least 10 days from onset of symptoms and until they are at least 72 hours has passed with no fever, without fever-reduced medication, and improvement of those symptoms. Notify the school of a positive case, monitor your child's symptoms, notify personal contacts, answer the calls from the local Board of Health, and um, you are required to have secure release from contact tracers, which are the local Board of Health or the Community Tracing Collaborative, for return to school. They will inform us when your child may return. Next slide, please. So close contacts of a positive COVID-19 case. Next slide, please. So if your child's determined to be a close contact, the student or staff member should stay home and be tested 45 days after last exposure if needed. If they're negative, they remain home for the full 14 days. The rationale behind that is that they could test positive on day 14. They can become symptomatic and they actually do have COVID-19. If um, they are exposed at school or on the bus, we are, our plan is to re keep them remained masked. We're going to physical distance students. Student must be picked up as soon as possible and cannot take the bus home. And the individual should stay home and can be tested four, days, four to five days after the last exposure if needed. If they get tested and they're positive, they must remain home and they are to have them, their symptoms monitored, notify the school nurse, notify personal close contacts, and answer the calls from the local Board of Health. So I just want to reiterate, unfortunately, if your child is considered a close contact, they must remain home if they are in self-isolation for 14 full days. Next slide, please. So positive test is reported midday. What is the school's actions going to be? The school will quickly identify close contacts and notify student families and staff members. Caregivers of the students in the class and close contacts should pick up students as soon as possible. Caregivers must wear a mask when picking up students. Students that are close contact or symptomatic cannot ride the bus home. They're going to wash their hands upon arrival at home and change their clothes as a precaution. Quarantine at home and the Board of Health will be contacting you. Close contacts cannot return to school until quarantine for 14 days, no matter the, the test results. Report any positive test results to the school. Next slide. Close contact information. Current Massachusetts Department guide, uh, guidance, all co close contacts of someone who has tested positive for COVID-19 should be quarantined. Staff and student, um, student and staff members who was in close contact with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19 can be tested after exposure if needed. Close contacts should. People in quarantine, again, should stay home for 14 days after exposure of COVID-19, separate from others, monitor symptoms, stay in a separate room from other households if possible, use a separate bathroom if possible, avoid a contact with other members of the household, don't share personal household items like cups, towels, and utensils, and wear a mask around other people if able. And then, of course, continue to monitor the health. Next slide, please. Close contact testing. Again, I just want to reiterate, if they are a close contact, if they're negative, they unfortunately are to be maintained in uh, quarantine for the full 14 days. So again, this is just another demonstration of how this works. Next slide. Okay, so close contact in your household. So I put this example together so that people can understand just because two people in a household live together does not mean if one person's on a quarantine that another person can't go to school or work. So you have an individual in your house is determined to be a close contact of a positive case. As long as the close contact individual has no symptoms, other individual in that household can go to work to school. Note, the close contact individual still needs to be quarantined away from the family members even though they have no symptoms. They can be asymptomatic and truly positive. Example, if a student in class A becomes a close contact with no symptoms of a positive case, then their sibling in classroom B, the sibling in, 
in the classroom B can continue to come to school while the student in classroom A stays home until quarantine period is completed. But if the close contact individual has symptoms, other individuals in the household will need to stay home and be quarantined at that point. Next slide. Student has symptoms in school and what are the school actions going to be? Next slide. So a teacher, the teacher, if a student is symptomatic, will ensure the student has a mask on and is six feet from everyone. Send the student to the waiting isolation room with their personal belongings if it's a non-transition time meaning no transfer of students is occurring in the hallways. If it's a transition time, they're gonna hold the student in class with a mask and social distancing until the hallway is clear and then send the student to the waiting isolation room with their personal belongings. The student plan will be the student must stay in the, in the medical waiting room until the parent guardian can come to the school. For the student being picked up midday, parent or guardian must wear a mask when picking up the student Hands should be washed and clothes should be changed once at home, and Burlington families expected to pick up their children within 30 minutes of that call from the nurse's office. Next slide. Symptoms at school continued. Once a student is home, again, students should be tested, isolated at home until tested, uh, test results are returned. The results, if negative, they must stay home until they're, fee they're symptom free for 24 hours without medication. But if they're positive, they are now in the isolation protocol for 10 days with three days having to pass with no fever and improved symptoms without fever reduce, reducing medication before they can return. If they're not tested, they unfortunately have to wait the 10 days and they can return 10 days from the start of the symptoms as long as their symptoms have improved and they have been without fever for 24 hours. Next slide. Student has symptoms on the bus. Next slide. What will the school do? We'll the bus driver will ensure the symptomatic student has a mask on and is physically distant from other students. Ensure every, everyone else on the bus is wearing a mask. Bus driver calls ahead to the bus dispatcher. The bus dispatcher will contact the school nurse to inform, inform her of a symptomatic student on the bus. When the bus arrives to the school, the school nurse or designated staff member meets the student at the bus. That student will be off the bus first, and the bus should be cleaned and disaffected once it's been evacuated by all, their, all other students. Next slide. So, student is now in the medical waiting room with the school nurse. Student needs to be dismissed. Parent or guardian, again, needs to be wearing a mask at pickup. Hands should be washed and clothes should be changed as, once, as soon as they arrive at home. And Burlington families, again, are expected to pick up their children within 30 minutes. Symptomatic students cannot take the bus home. We can't send any ill students home on the bus. Next slide. Symptomatic on the bus continued. Once the student's at home, students should be tested. If not, if not tested, student needs to stay home for 14 days and until asymptomatic. Isolate home until the test results are returned. Again, results negative, must stay home until symptom free for 24 hours without fever reducing medication. If not tested, they may return to school 10 days from the start of the symptoms as long as those symptoms have improved and they've been without fever reducing um, medication for 24 hours. If positive, isolation protocol of 10 days with at least three days have passed with no fever and improved symptoms without fever reducing medication. Next slide. So actually yesterday, new regulations came out um, that we are required to adhere to all immunization requirements from the Mass Department of Public Health, no matter what model of learning your child is going to be in. Additionally, they added an inoculation that's going to be required of every child attending schools this year, and I do believe that is going to be permanent, is an influenza vaccine must be required of all students by December 31st. And again, in the pink box, I attached the link to the document from the DPH for your viewing. Next slide. Testing required for recent travel. 
as you know, the governor has put in place a travel order for anybody that has traveled to high risk areas. If your child has traveled to a high risk area in the last 14 days prior to school starting, your child is going to be required to be tested or they must go through the full 14 day um, quarantine. Again, no antigen testing result will be accepted. It must be a molecular test because the antigen testing is unreliable. Again, in the pink box is the link for the regulations for your viewing at your leisure. Next slide. Classroom school and district closure. The Board of Health will collaborate the nurse leader and the assistant superintendent on making decisions for classroom, individual school, and or district closures. The decision factors are case by case basis, the amount of exposure and potential spread that occurred in the school. They will follow the CDC guidelines when a confirmed case enters the school. When in doubt, the district will err on the side of caution and close certain schools, uh, classroom schools and or the district. But the Board of Health takes the lead on the closures. Next slide. And then here is the slide with my contact information if you have any specific questions. We hope that you all be well and safe. And please use this PowerPoint to help support us in creating a safe school environment for our children. So Robert, thank you very much. Barbara, thank you. That was a whole lot of information. Yes, it was. I'm glad the PowerPoint uh, is available for, for everybody. Um, just to reiterate uh, a few changes that, uh, again, happened yesterday. Yes is the Mass Department of Public Health is requiring all students who are going to be attending school to have a flu shot by December 31st. So that I is think correct. That's a, that's a new regulation. And so, um, again, that's new information for parents. And you mentioned that you believe that's going to be an ongoing yes. um, requirement uh, as, as we move forward. Uh, for school closures, um, I think that uh, the Board of Health will be certainly um, the experts that we draw upon but it'll still be the district that makes that decision. So, so part of the challenge with this is a lot of the communication to families sort of regarding COVID may come through the Board of Health, but if schools are gonna close, it'll still be, again, a call from me, uh, again, after the advice from the yourself, uh, the Assistant Superintendent and the Board of Health. Um, and I just wanna say it's, it's a poor analogy just because I know the virus is much, is, is um, is much more serious. But um, when there's a snow day call, we, we don't just say if it snows six inches, we cancel school. It all depends on the type of snow, how warm, how cold. Um, I talk to D, uh, the Department of Public Works uh, and then um, get their opinion. Are the roads clear? Are the sidewalks clear? So there's a whole bunch of different factors that go into that. And I'm assuming for a school or district closure, there'll be a whole bunch of different factors. It's not gonna be one factor or one thing. Um, you know that we that that uh, that we can you know that we look at and consider, and I think the most important thing that I've taken from your presentation um, is that this is really a community effort. It's not just about putting uh, precautions in place in school. It really needs to be a partnership with parents, families, and the entire community because we're only as safe as as uh, the people in the community who are practicing the least amount of caution. If everyone is wearing a mask, if everyone is washing their hands, if everyone is you know, making sure they're staying socially distance, distant, if the uh, percent positivity in the cases in the community stay low, then it's more than likely or hopefully the schools have a better chance of staying open longer. And if parents can practice the mask wearing, practice the social distancing, and really encourage their children to be part, their safe behaviors as being part of a community effort, um, I think a lot of times for children, doing something for someone else is much easier than almost doing it for them, themselves. And I think, um, again, I, I like the saying that when you wear a mask, it's really not for you, it's for, it's for the safety uh, of everyone else. So again, I just want to end tonight, again, with gratitude. Barbara, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Board of Health. Uh, thank you to BCAT. But really encouraging um, families in the community and the entire community to please practice the precautions that go with COVID. I know it's been a long time. I know people are fatiguing. I know it's easy sometimes to say, oh, you know, I've been doing this for five or six months. Um, uh, I don't need to do it anymore. But uh, when schools open, it's gonna be really important that uh, the schools practice um, 
all of these precautions and we're, um, we're being very careful about it. But we also know that people, we don't want to bring um, all those bad behaviors into school either. So we're going to ask that the community uh, really redouble their efforts and make sure that they are uh, wearing masks, practicing social distancing, and all of the other things that we've learned about. If you have any questions, again, the COVID um, email is, is always available. Uh, Barbara left her email and contact information in, in the slideshow, and we'll be uh, asking BCAT, or I think BCAT has been rerunning these shows uh, periodically uh, throughout the week. So again, I know this was a lot of information uh, all at once. Um, I think there are some patterns that you'll recognize as you go through the information, um, but the information is readily available to you, um, again, on our website, um, through BCAT, or um, we can even sort of email um, the PowerPoint out to people if, if they would find that helpful so they have it um, at their fingertips if they want to do that. So again, this is our fourth installment of Thursday Night uh, TV. Um, thank you um, for watching us. And um, we look forward, I think next Thursday, we're going to try to, um, we may not have a BCAP broadcast, but I believe we're going to try to uh, uh, host a meeting between the, the school committee and the Board of Health, um, you know, as prior to uh, when students return. And um, we look forward to continuing to work with them, uh, the Board of Health, as, as we move forward. So again, thank you very much. And uh, I wanna, again, we look forward to seeing you again next Thursday.